Can you hear me okay? Yeah? I'm a bit soft-spoken, so raise your hand <coughs> if I ever um, peter out. So this is a panel about membership in other industries. And so the way I see it, my job is really to showcase the different programs and the people that we have on stage here so that you better understand how the very sort of raw ideas we've discussed, loyalty, coupons, discounts, how they actually sort of make themselves manifest in different contexts. And one thing that really struck me as I spoke to all of these panelists in advance, so we have, and I'll move down the row, so we have um, John, who's here from NYU. Hope you don't mind if I, John Pine. Then we have Chris Woodard from Fresh Direct. We have Winston Shi from Harley Davidson. And I, get the, I guess I get to ask the question, how many people in the audience own a Harley Davidson? So that Venn diagram. Like <laughs> yeah, that Venn diagram. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Julie Allison from Blue State Digital. Um, so I think what, we're, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually walk my way down the row, asking each of them a series of questions so you can really see how membership comes into play in their work. Now, one thing that really struck me when I was speaking to them before the panel is actually how much their work has changed over the last five to 10 years. So I think in journalism, we very much see membership as an idea in this moment in time. So you know, people have referenced <coughs> the fact that certain revenue streams are not as lucrative as they used to be, that we're really thinking of ways that we can build that deep build and retain that deep and loyal audience. And these are questions that everyone who I spoke to said they're also dealing with. And the sort of technological pressures and demands, the changing consumer expectations that we confront all the time are very much issues at the forefront in their minds. So what I want to do in this panel in particular is not just make sense of their membership programs, but actually to see them in context in time. Because that's actually one of the most interesting things, is how they've taken these very basic ideas that we've discussed and are actually using them to build and maintain programs themselves. So John, you're first. <coughs> um, so John, you told me when we spoke over the phone about your work at NYU. And I think one of the things I'd like you to do is to describe the different ways in which NYU essentially does membership. So I'm thinking about you know, NYU access, whether it's the um, career programs or its discounts. If you can give people a sort of overview of what it actually looks like mm -hmm. at NYU. Sure, so uh, thank you so much for moderating too. Um, so I, I work with alumni at NYU, so it's a little bit different. So many of you might think of higher ed in the sense of admissions and the student experience, and I work with people after they leave. So we have sort of a unique advantage with membership that there's very, so first of all, who went to college? <laughs> right, cool, I hope so. Uh, and we have an advantage that most of you only went to one college. So you're only a member of one alumni association. Now, we don't really have competition, right? So if you went to NYU, thank you for your money and for your time. Um, and so our members are all alumni, all people who went through our programs. We have almost half a million across the world. We have the largest of any private school. Um, and so what we do to engage our members is primarily through programs. So we do a number of different things in New York and all over the world to try to get people to stay connected to the university. So uh, in New York, we have things like career networking. So when you're a student, and years ago, you would think, uh, I go to college and I go to a placement office and they help me get a job. It doesn't work that way anymore, right? There's no placement in higher ed. You kind of have to do your own work to get a job. Um, and the same thing goes for alumni. For years, there was sort of an expectation that you spent all this money to go to school um, and then you're gonna get lifetime support for a job. Again, it doesn't really work that way anymore. So we have a responsibility and obligation to figure out ways to con connect people through the Alumni Association to help them find opportunities to get involved. And the one thing that we talked about uh, on the phone is our access program. And basically what that is, is when I was hired to come to New York and come to NYU, they said, you know, we can't engage people in New York City. How do you compete with New York City? And I said, well, you don't. You have to join it. You have to figure out ways to use what the city has and what we're good at and kind of connect our alumni there. So what we did is we kind of went out through our alumni association and we found the people that are doing interesting things, right? Like working at Fresh Direct, working at kind of fun places and said, we want to spotlight you. We want to focus you and what you bring to the city and allow other people to have a part of it. So your connection as a member of the alumni association is that you get to experience something interesting and cool that's happening in the city. Um, and that has been tremendously successful. We've had a number of programs 
that have used people who own restaurants, who work at cool companies, who uh, work in, of course, for NYU, so we have lots of people on Broadway, so lots of people who are in shows or on TV. We use them as sort of an insider access to, um, to show people something that they're doing. And it makes you sort of feel cool and intimate <coughs> and connected. Um, and that's been tremendously successful for us. Now, you also told me when we talked that the alumni program has changed dramatically in the last five years, particularly. So before, and I don't want to <coughs> say too much on your behalf, but that before, membership was something that you paid into. <coughs> but now, everyone is considered a member. Right. And the second thing is that given, I think, the economy, given the cost of education, that people's relationship with the university has fundamentally changed because they have a long outstanding financial relationship that they didn't used to have. And so can you speak to how that, those two, the, how the economy has actually reshaped how you pursue membership and what, and why in particular you made that shift from a paying program to an all membership program? Right, and this is sort of a trend. So it, did anyone go to like a big, like a university of state school with like a big football team? Yeah, so you're like, I went to the University of Georgia for graduate school, so like, you know, we like went out and you're like, football tickets, I'm gonna spend $500 over my lifetime, I'm gonna get football tickets, and you're a member of the Alumni Association. That was what almost every school did. So you paid, after you, first of all, you paid for school, you paid for the product to get yourself an education, then you left, and then we hounded you to pay again to become a member of the Alumni Association. And what happened across the board, there's very few schools that do this anymore, it just, wasn't realistic. People were like, why? Why am I gonna pay that money? I don't care what you're giving me, it's stupid. And so almost every school, there's maybe a handful now that still do it, um, have gotten rid of that, including NYU. And so we had to sort of figure out, well now what? And the other reason is because 40 years ago, most people that went to college paid for it with a job or their families helped them or they had scholarship. Again, it doesn't work that way anymore. You go to NYU, most people are walking out with debts in almost the six figures. So, which you're like, oh, oh God, if you have kids, you're like, no, please. So uh, it's, it's a different story, right? So we can't expect people to then pay again for something else to just stay involved with the university. So we really had to change across the industry in alumni relations. We had to change the way that we communicate with people. Uh, and so we still have fundraising. That's still a part of what we do, but it's not exactly what I do. So. Um, so we had to look at what are we providing people um, that will make them want to stay connected. So what are the services, what are the offerings, what are the programs that we can do that will help people stay connected to the university? Um, we don't have football at NYU, so we can't like march people out to a big stadium and <laughs> rah, rah, go violets. We can't do that. So I wish, but we can't. So uh, we have to find alternatives to that. And so we find the programs, some of the stuff I talked about before, that allow people to stay connected with us as members of the Alumni Association for free. So it's pretty simple. You have 13 credits from NYU, not a lot. You're a member of the Alumni Association for free, nothing. That's, that's it, 13 credits. Um, which you're like, really, that's all? But um, <laughs> some schools, it's three credits. And so we're like, please, stay involved. Right? We want you to stay connected. So that's, uh, that's part of what, what we've done and what across the industry has changed. <clears throat> So that's one big shift. Another that you told me about is actually how um, the membership programs manage themselves or organize themselves abroad. So you said that you know, the, the sort of default model before was that alum could volunteer to organize other alum in their areas, and they would essentially form clubs. And that that model itself is also sort of, I wouldn't say petering out, but there's less interest in that. And can you, can you right. also speak to that? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a word that we throw around our office a lot, um, entitlement, right? And so, you know, everyone thinks of like millennials as being this very entitled generation. And for, and I'm one of them, so I can say this, right? Um, uh, yes, it's kind of true for us. You know, we don't have the same expectation that before you had this really passionate experience in higher ed and college and you want to like continue that relationship. Now the expectation is that we will do that for them. <clears throat> So the office, you paid all this money to come to NYU, for a lifetime, we're gonna continue to provide you with those things. Whereas before, people would sort of volunteer to do it on their own. And that really doesn't happen as much. It still does happen, uh, especially globally, where we find there's the most interest. So outside of the US, we find that the most people want to stay connected, want to be involved, want to meet other people from their school. And there's a whole lot of reasons that go behind that. Um, but 
for us, that's sort of what we see has changed quite a bit. Um, that people are less interested in the volunteer opportunities to kind of stay connected with NYU and much more the what can we provide them? What are the things that we are giving them? And I say the word entitlement because a lot of people say, well, oh, it's because people feel entitled after coming to NYU or after going to whatever fill in the blank school. Um, and maybe there's some truth behind that, but um, we notice the change in the industry, we have to adapt to it, and that's what we've done. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to move on to Chris. Um, so Chris came to Fresh Direct with a massive amount of what you call customer engagement experience and operations experience as well. And um, you know we talked about what he's learned from being at Fresh Direct. I think particularly what how Fresh Direct sees their most loyal customers and how they've built membership around them. You'll see a fundamentally different model emerging from Fresh Direct than I think from NYU, in part because. Um, of who they consider to be or not be a member. So let you take it from there. Sure. So um, you know, my, just a little background. So my role there is relatively new since I started. Um, and not to say that we didn't focus on retention engagement, but um, that team just you know, saw, saw a lot of opportunity there, of course. Much easier to retain a customer and make them more loyal than, than get a new customer. Right. Um, so my role is is focused on all customer touch points um, once they come in the door and, and optimizing all of them um, and to make them more loyal. And, and within that realm is uh, our, you know, what we call our loyalty program, which is, uh, it's not an aspirational program, you just kind of fall into it when you hit certain spending or, or frequency threshold, um, as well as our delivery pass, which uh, is a subscription uh, service where you pay a fee and you get unlimited deliveries, um, ability to make reservations and, and other perks. Um, so some of the things that, that we focus on um, it, you know, within those two areas to, to start, just to, to kind of focus there. Um, so our Chef's Table program is, is the loyalty program. And um, you basically need to be a, be a high spend, $1,500 or, or 12 purchases within a, a three-month period. And what we do there is, is not only give them kind of basic uh, you know, weekly discounts and, and sneak peeks, but try to provide very unique experiences. Um, so we're doing more and more things that um, you can't even find anywhere else, and, and a lot of people don't even know that, that we do, because um, it's really kind of a niche market. So a couple of examples. A um, month or two ago, the specialty uh, fancy food show uh, was in New York, and we had tickets for, for folks and kind of walked them around and um, you know, hooked them up with, with some of our you know, scary foodies that, 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 that work at Fresh Direct, uh, and scary in, in a great way, where um, you can talk to people that say, you know, would be tasting a grape and like, oh, this was definitely grown on the north side of the, of the tree, um, you know, that or the vine. Um, but uh, another example we did, we partnered with uh, MasterCard and their priceless table uh, experiences and actually had a very uh, small setting uh, in the Temple of Dendor in, in the Met um, with, uh, you know, a chef. Um, so it was just experiences that you can't find anywhere else and just allowing people to kind of experience food and experience Fresh Direct in, in different ways. So you celebrate the food itself. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So you also told me, you know, when we talked about how the industry is changing, because, um, you know, a lot of your focus is on how to make loyal customers not just that much more loyal, but also how to identify them. And you said that, you know, the expect consumer expectations are shifting radically. So Fresh Direct, you can think of it as deliver tomorrow. And then there are other services that are about deliver now. And so can, can you speak about how you are not rethinking membership, but in your case, loyalty, in order to, to maintain that and grow that customer base. Yeah. Um, so, you know, to the, to the point about, about expectations, I think you know, everybody wants what they want now, right? Um, and they want it simply tailored for them. Um, and they, they want it, uh, you know, wherever they are, right? And so we're trying to, to get into each of those areas. So whether it's mobile um, or, uh, you know, partnering with uh, recipe sites and, and allowing people to shop directly from those sites. Hit, you know, click a button, goes right into your Fresh Direct cart. Um, so we do that with Epicurious and uh, Bon Appetit and Foodily. If anybody's hungry and wants to to check it out, please do. Um, to um, making our mobile experiences better um, and you know allowing people to experience Fresh Direct um, and and be inspired. Um, 
no matter where they are, whether it's Facebook, um, you know, or on these recipe sites, and, and trying to be where they are. And of course, we're always trying to, to, to get faster, right? Um, to get people um, what they want uh, when they want it. And so behind that is, is personalization. So our customers have huge expectations because they shop, our best customers shop with us every week. Um, you know, and we are in people's kitchens, walking into doors. So it's a very personal relationship um, that uh, you know, we're very lucky to have. Um, but with that comes you know, that expectation of, hey, you know me very well. You know what I buy every week. You know I'm a vegan. Don't show me a, a lamb recipe on the homepage, please. Um, you know, there's, there's all that expectation. And, and some of that, of course, is, is easier to do than, than not. But um, so we are vastly improving our, our, our data um, and making our strides um, to be much more personalized in, in every communication that we send um, and every experience that you have, uh, whether it be our emails or, or our experience with drivers. We've also gotten requests for vegan photo filters at The Guardian <laughs> from, some, from some of our readers. Um, so I think just to sort of recap, when you think about NYU, there's a shift right from a paying program to an all-inclusive program, but also one that focuses much more on career service and you know, giving people ways to explore, in particular in New York City, through their alum. And I think it's fair to say, um, you know, at FreshDirect, it's like FreshDirect everywhere, so how people can use the site, whether they're reading recipes on other sites or you know, it's mobile accessibility, as well as thinking about the different ways they can celebrate food. Which brings us then to Harley Davidson. Um, so Winston, I know that Harley Davidson, there is the corporation, then there are the franchises. If you don't mind for a moment, let's, we can set aside the, I guess the, the sort of, um, the legal differences between them, um, and talk just generally about membership at Harley Davidson. I'm thinking about the Hog program, yes. um, which I'm sure everyone will enjoy hearing about. Can you give everyone an overview of that? Sure. So when I um, was speaking to Amanda, I, I, first thing I said was, I'm not sure if I can really contribute to this membership discussion because we really don't have memberships within Harley, and as Amanda mentioned there's Harley Corporate that sits in Milwaukee and then all the dealerships that you see near your hometown or whatever are franchises and so there is a connection there but there's a lot there's very dense amount of franchises here and uh, I'm part of one that we have three shops of there's other ones that are nearby they're actually competitors even though they have the Harley Barn and Shield you know, Barn and Shield and it's not up there but that is a Harley image right there um, so the only membership, as, as Man and I spoke, I'm like, oh, there is a membership, and it's called HOG. And so HOG is a nickname that's given to the bikes way back when, because harley Davidsons tend to be very, very large bikes. And so it got the nickname HOG, but they also took that nickname and made it into an acronym and made it uh, Harley Owners Group. And so that is the only membership that Harley really has as, a, as the definition that I think of a traditional membership. And that means when you buy a motorcycle, and it has to be a new one, it can't be a pre-owned one, otherwise known as a used bike, you get automatic membership for one year free. And then after that, you have to pay. Uh, the membership includes things, they try to cover a broad range of what people may want. So if you're looking for roadside assistance, they allow you to get that at a discount. So it's kind of like a AAA for motorcycles. If you're trying to ship your bike, uh, they give you discounts and access to different vendors that offer discounts. They um, let you, uh, th they share this magazine that talks about different trips and all this stuff. And, and then it also allows you to join your local chapter. So in every uh, major city, there's a local chapter of, of HOG. So here it's the NYC HOG chapter. And you have to belong to the national in order to join the local. The local usually has a small due, it's like $20. And, People get pretty serious about it. They vote officers in, they plan events, and all these different things. But uh, the one thing I told Amanda was that when you look at the HOG membership, and I'm glad no one here has a motorcycle, it means no one here is uh, a HOG <laughs> member, it tends to be the older demographic. And I think that is the challenge that Harley has from many years ago. They're trying, the, the typical uh, Harley consumer is male. Uh, white and in their 50s. And so Harley's really trying to come down and grab women, minorities, uh, the younger crowd. And so you can see it across the bikes if you, if you haven't seen the bikes and your image is these big chopper 
easy rider type bikes, it's completely different. In fact, that was my image uh, of, of Harley, and I've been working there for a year and a half. I do e-commerce and marketing now. I started on the sales side, so right on the floor selling, and I was, that was my view of Harley, this old big bike, and I really didn't like the bikes. I rode other bikes. I've been riding for 15 years, and, and then when I came, I was like, wow, these bikes are really nice. The designs have been updated really well, and, um, and now I own one, and I must say, of all the motorcycles I had, it's probably the most fun. So we don't have membership, but we do try to bring people in uh, for the lifestyle. And so I don't know, should I keep going, or do you uh, want to add something else? I want to add something. <laughs> yeah. So just to underscore then, you know, with the HOG program, membership is offered to the first time, or not just first time, but it's offered to the person just purchased right. a bike. And then it's opt-in after one year. Now, when we were talking, you, know, you just mentioned that the demographic trend line was pretty clear. So. 50s, male, white, and that a lot of your job is focused on changing that demographic trend line. And you are in New York City of all places. So, you know, I don't have a Harley. I hope to ride a Harley. Yes. I'm coming, going by the office. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, a lot of the advertising, it's, you know, west, it's the southwest, it's the big vistas, the big roads, and you are in New York City, which I frankly, I'm terrified just to ride my bicycle down the street. Um, so I'd like you to speak a little bit to what work you're doing now, because you, what you told me was that not only is there a shift away from the hog program per se, but there's a much bigger focus on experience and really thinking about how people can largely experience the brand of Harley Davidson. And that's a different way of thinking about membership. It's an affinity to the brand, so can you yeah. take from there? Uh, yeah, I'll take it from there. So um, I think one advantage that Harley has, which could be a double-edged sword, is that it's a very known brand. It's a lifestyle, right? And we often say, you see people with tattoos of Harley Davidson. You don't see anybody with a tattoo with Honda, Triumph, Ducati. <laughs> I mean, no one has that, right? So Harley has succeeded in making the brand a very lifestyle brand. And um, if you were to come by our store, which is downtown, you would see Everything from the typical jackets to helmets to doormats and shot glasses and you name it. If you can put a Harley logo on it, Harley has done it. And so it's um, so we try to capitalize that on that as a franchise. And I think Harley Corporate tries to capitalize that as as a big entity. So it's more the lifestyle. One of the taglines is when you get a Harley, especially if you had some other bike other than Harley, it's welcome to the dark side. So this whole thing of Harley and, you know, you're, you're a bit of a rebel, you're um, kind of off the beaten path, you know, it's kind of leveraging the uh, Hell's Angels type thing. A lot of people, that's their, that's their view. But that also can also be a double-edged sword. As I said, there was uh, just a month ago or so, Harley has a program now for uh, military folks, veterans or active duty, that if you want to learn how to ride a motorcycle, they'll pay for it free. And usually to learn a motorcycle, if you're going through a course, it costs around three to $400. So it's free, it's a great program. We want to announce it. They decided to announce it on Fox News, Morning News. Um, and uh, we canceled it because it was the same time down, I think, in Waco, Texas, where there was this shootout between these motorcycle people. and they. Harley corporate didn't want this question about, well, what's about this, all these gangs? You know, there still is this uh, relationship of Harleys to gangs. And so they didn't want that relationship. So we canceled it, and then we scheduled it a little bit later. So there is this thing where you're trying to kind of balance all, all those good and bad things. And some people like the gang approach and all that. And you don't want to dilute the brand and say, we've gotten sissy now. And you know, and there's, <laughs> it's all like these little yuppies that just buy the bike and keep it in the, more, in the garage. And there's a lot of comments about that too. So it's really interesting to see what corporate hands down to us to kind of play and try to include everybody in this group. Um, but we try to leverage here in New York City all the things that New York City has. We, we think we have an advantage, even over other big cities like Boston, Chicago, San Diego. Those are all really big dealerships, but no, no city has the cachet of New York City. So we really try to focus on concrete jungle. You know, there's really a surf and skate scene here. We're style on the edge of style and things like that. So we really try to incorporate that into our franchise message. And, going out to people and saying, hey, this is New York City. If you wear New York City on your shirt, everybody's going to know what that is. If you wear uh, 
Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, no one's really going to know what that is. But Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania may have a bigger <coughs> Harley customer base than we do. And I was telling Amanda that Harley here in the metro New York area is actually a very small market share. It's only 20%. The other 80% uh, is dominated by what's called metric bikes, which is all the other bikes that come overseas and they use metric units like me centimeters and, and uh, instead of like inches for an English unit bike, which is like a Harley. So we really do try to focus on that and I think um, that's something that helps us and makes the brand more relevant to the new demographic that Harley's trying to go after, which is minorities, younger crowd and all that. So I put, um Julie Allison at the at the end. Julie works um, at Blue State Digital and was on the Obama campaign. I put her at the end because she consults different organizations on how to use technology. So it's not fair to ask her, you know, what is the model at BSD. Um, but what I would like to ask her is, you know, what was the model um, for the campaign? And then two, when you are advising organizations on this question. You know, what is the sort of basic advice you give them? Great. Um, so I'm going to come back to Jeff because he kind of stole this from me. Uh, instead of the marketing funnel, we have the ladder of engagement. And that is a, an organizing principle that if you've ever done volunteer work or community engagement, um, hopefully you, you've seen some version of this. Um, but it's really the theory that, you know, at your biggest base is the people who are observing you. So. You know, they might see a lawn sign, they might go by the office or the field office and say, oh, like, what's happening here? Um, and that's going to be your biggest pool. And that's really, you know, when you think about the comparison, that's your reader base or the people that maybe like your Facebook page. Um, and really, your, your job as an organizer or as a digital strategist or as a fundraiser <laughs> is to work those people up the ladder. Um, and so it's, it's definitely uh, a tiered approach and something that is really, uh, the success is dependent upon your ability to meet where they are on that ladder. Um, but that really drove kind of the overall strategy across whether it was, you know, online organizing, so getting people to turn out for events. You know, if you had only really given your name, the next ask I'm going to give you is not to host a, host a party <laughs> at your house, because that's a pretty extreme ask. Um, the, the ask may be, you know what, your neighbor's having this party, why don't you stop by and say hi? And from there, the organizers on the ground are trained to have those conversations with people to get them to be more involved. Um, and, and, and likewise, on the digital side, we're following kind of what actions people are taking so that we can um, you know, support that with relevant messaging, relevant asks. Um, that really get people you know, to the top of the ladder, which is you know, probably a smaller group than that larger base, but extremely important because those are either your community, vol you know, your team leaders who are organizing those parties and who are rallying their communities, or they're the people who are you know, ultimately becoming recurring donors and your biggest advocates. So um, you know, it was a full approach across offline and online. But uh, that really carries over to the work at Blue State. Um, we were founded in the political sphere with a fellow dean, <laughs> co-workers of Amanda's. Um, and, and we consult with a number of nonprofits, advocacy organizations, and some brands that you're probably familiar with, like the Sierra Club, uh, Heifer International, NAACP, to Ford and Google. And we really work to instill this, uh, this relationship approach. And so I feel like I'm really with my people here today <laughs> because we're talking about community, we're talking about relationships. And we're really working with these large organizations who you know, are, are institutional. Um, they have some institutional baggage because of the size of what they've been doing and, and the scope of, of the problems they're trying to solve, but really trying to dig in and work across teams, work across departments to put that person first who's on the other side um, and, and really build better relationships between organizations and their people. And so I will also uh, support what Amanda said, that everyone is struggling with this. Um, we see this, and that's why it's really fun um, to be in kind of the position we are, because we get to see across all these different sectors what are the common challenges, how are people addressing this, and then hopefully have that mind share um, across best practices. So when we, when we talked, you also very forcefully said at one point, like, this is a mistake you know, the organizations make. And you know, implicit in this idea of a ladder of engagement is that people are moving up, oh, yeah. but that also there is a holistic view, right, of how people relate to the organization. And what you said was, you know, organizations fail when they try and sort of like tack membership on to the outside. Can you go into that in a bit more detail? Because you've been able to see this mistake then happen across <laughs> different yeah, organizations. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I also have sort of media background, so I, I understand very much the concept of church and state. And uh, 
that infiltrated kind of how I saw this because there really wasn't a room within those two departments or those two ways of thinking uh, to think about the user. You know, that was someone thinking about content, someone thinking about sales, but no one was really the advocate for who was that person on the other side. And so I think structurally we created these companies and these organizations that didn't have an audience first mindset. You know, it was fundraising, it was communications, it was policy, um, but who was that, who was the voice of the user within any of those? You know, ideally it was someone who was, uh, who had access to the data or was on the ground and, and having conversations with people, but there wasn't really a natural home for, for that to enforce the strategy. Um, and so we, you know, a big part of what we do is to get people to understand that. And, you know, I always think about when you're on the receiving end of an email, like you don't care which department it came from. You just know that it came from the Sierra Club. You know, you don't care what the internal struggles were um, between fundraising and policy to get that email out. We all know about approval chains <laughs> and what that's like. Um, you just care because it's relevant to you because you signed up for this organization because you're interested in the subject matter. And so um, a big part of what we do is try to peel away uh, some organizational baggage, we, you know, could be said it is, um, and, and really put that user first. Think about what is going to be meaningful to them, and I think a big tool in having these conversations with organizations um, and across departments where there might be some land grabs happening is, is really focusing on the data. And, and I think the data and, and getting aligned about what we're measuring, um, who these people are, can really bring uh, kind of the conversation in line um, because ultimately, you know, we're going to get more names, we're going to get more people, we're going to get more donors, but uh, this has to happen as a, as a holistic approach across departments. So it's not easy, I'm not saying it is, but I think it's absolutely necessary for organizations to succeed. So now I have a few questions that I want each of them to answer, sort of rapid fire. So I'll do the first one and start here with John. And then I'm also going to open it up for questions in about 10 minutes. So do start thinking about what you'd like to ask them. And again, my, my you know, goal is to showcase the work that they do and the differences between their approaches um, so that you know who to ask for what. Um, so my first question is about metrics. So how is it, like what are the most important metrics that you use at work? And I just want to sort of poke at this a little bit. I think it's very easy and you know for us to talk about quantitative measures, but there are lots of things that you can't apply you know or think of in that way. So what are also essential qualitative measures? And you know just for each of you to speak, I think for about a minute, you can muse out loud too if you're trying to sort out some of these answers at work as as you go. So John, uh, okay. So we uh, we use a series of of quantitative measures to measure. Um, the people that participate with us. So uh, first time attendees is a big one that we do, first time participants. Um, another one is donors, are people supporting the university financially. Uh, another one is uh, age, but it's really time of graduation. So people who graduated in the last 10 years versus um, past that. Um, one thing that we have used a lot more recently, which I guess is I could quantify, but we never have, is how quickly things sell out. That's, I don't know why, but that's just been a huge, like we know, like, oh, if that thing sold out in 20 minutes, like, we got a winner, right? So like, that has been something that we've done a lot recently. And then every person who's ever planned events, I think, has that feeling of, you know it went well or you know it didn't. And so you kind of walk out of the room and you're like, that was good, right? That was a solid mm -hmm. program. And then other times you're like, nope, something didn't work. Mm -hmm. Something wasn't right there, didn't feel right. Um, we do use that a lot. I have a team of five people that are, that are programming in, in the city and across the country. Um, and I think we all, you hire the right person that you know has that kind mm -hmm. of feeling. Um, and then post events, we use uh, surveys for everything. We use what's called the NPS or the Net Promoter Score. <coughs> I'm sure most of you have heard of that. Um, and that's, we, we look at all of our programming in aggregate uh, against the Net Promoter Score to see what people say. And it's really interesting. We've seen a lot more recently um, this vast difference in what people rate us versus what they say about us. So like, uh, they'll say like, it was a great program, had an awesome time, and they'll give us like a four. <laughs> and we're like, what? Like on a one to 10, they're like, you know, say a four. Or they'll say like, you know, the food sucked, and they'll give us a 10. And we just like, it's, there's no rhyme or reason to it, but, but that's I guess the way people fill out surveys, so. Sure. Uh, so, so with us, ultimately, um, it's about how much you spend um, and your frequency um, of, of your orders. But to get there, um, there's a lot that, that go into it to optimize that, right? So from an email perspective, we're looking at open rates, engagements, click rates. Um, we also do a lot of, of listening. Um, so reaching out to customers on, on a personal level. Um, one of the first things I did when, when I started was, was send an email to, you know, 
top third of our best customers just asking for, for feedback um, and gave them my actual email address, which I don't recommend if you don't have some time to set aside. <laughs> Um, but you know, I, I kind of knew it going in, and, and um, you know, basically spent two days uh, answering e emails um, and getting on the phone and talking to people. And um, you know, as much as data uh, drives really what we do, um, you know, that's 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 the goal. But you really need to understand the, the humanity behind it and understand um, what's what problems you're trying to solve with people. Um, you know, are you making their lives easier because they're uh, you know, as a working single mom is just running around so prepared meals for her. Um, or are you a foodie that wants to know the second that, um, you know, very unique uh, smoked salmon comes in or the oleo novello of the year is, is, is the first to arrive, you want to be the first. A very different experience. Um, and so you need to understand the, the thought process behind and the lifestyles behind it in order to get to those top level metrics. Winston? Yeah, my metrics are very similar to Chris's, and it probably makes sense. Our members are really our, our customers. And so we do, and I mentioned to Amanda, and she said maybe you can try to highlight it, is more uh, qualitative type uh, measures. So we are very social media based. So the number of likes on um, Facebook or the number of views on Instagram are very important. We are trying to build a community. I and mean, that's ultimately our goal is to build a community that we put a lot out there that's going to resonate with someone who's a core person, so your typical Harley customer or someone who's just new to the bike. And so we're lucky in that we do a lot of events. Every week we have events, so we have rides, we have barbecues, so we're able to connect to those people. And we take qual uh, qualitative measures of are you enjoying yourself, are you coming back, um, and all those things. And, and what we found out is you, you need that qualitative. My, my past life is more data driven. And so if you just look at the data, it can lead to a completely different answer if you don't have that qualitative uh, landscape to put it against. And so we, we, we make all these posts. And we discovered that if we, we put a post out that was just about five things to consider if you're looking to buy a used bike. It had nothing to do with Harley. There was no cool pictures or anything. And it got one of the highest views and likes because it resonated with people that are out there. It was informative, and it had nothing to do with like a hard sell or anything like that. So that is the that is the measures that we constantly look for are are those kind of ones that we just can't get just looking at a bunch of numbers. Great. Um, well, you know, on the digital practitioner side and, and strategist, I think, you know, we're looking and membership to me means action. It means uh, you know very trackable action, <laughs> um, something that someone has done on your website via email. Um, and so we really pay attention to those conversion points. And you know, open rates are great, but if people didn't actually do the thing you want them to do, then you need to rethink the strategy and the content and the approach. Um, so we're constantly working with people and ourselves to, to drill down those conversion points. You know, did someone click through, but then they, they got lost in the form because there were too many form fields, so they're dropping off. Well, that's a miss, huge missed opportunity um, because someone expressed interest, and then we weren't able to deliver on the user experience side. So um, constantly kind of tracking yourself on, you know, once you've worked people as up the ladder of engagement, um, where, where are you seeing drop off, but also where do you think that there's more kind of juice out of lemon to squeeze, um, and where do you think you can get more? Um, and then, you know, as a on the organizational side, I think, Qualitatively, when I hear someone who we've been working with for a while and on a, more of an education partnership um, come back in a meeting and say, well, you know, we should really have an email sign up on that page, that like makes my heart so happy because it's really starting to educate um, these organizations who have done things one way, whether they're flooding page views to a site but not really getting any more data or understanding who's coming to the site, um, getting them to really rethink the relationship that they can have with their people. Um, you know, we still treat email as a really important uh, tool for, to build that relationship. So, you know, when you start to see thinking change, that's a really exciting uh, partnership. So I'm going to open up after my next question. So, Jeff, if you can help me round up questions after. Um, I'm taking the liberty of taking a little extra time. Um, <laughs> although it's always dangerous to stand between people at lunch. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> um, uh, so my, my next question is this, you know, all of you have talked about how you can essentially serve your most loyal um, users, however defined. What are the, just name one to two trends or sort of um, factors that you expect to change in coming years that you're trying to prepare for? Like what 
is affecting the relationship. This might be less, um, I think, it might be less germane to you, Winston, I think, to, in particular, Chris. But if you can speak about, like, I think, if, if not, what are one or two questions you're thinking about in terms of changing your practice? So, Jilly, when you're advising organizations, what do you tell them to watch out for? Yeah, um, I think the biggest thing is, is, is what's been said all along, is just really getting out of your head and getting out of your silos and getting out of um, the way we've done it before. You know, you look at, I'm looking at the Airbnbs of the world, I'm looking at the Ubers, who have really naturally formed these communities. Yes, they have department called, you know, the community department, <laughs> which I think is novel and exciting. Um, but, you know, they've really created a natural home for people. They provide value to them. Um, and they have a very transparent uh, relationship with them, even though what they're getting is somewhat transactional. You know, it's a service. Um, and so I'm really working with organizations and, you know, Blue State as an organization ourselves on, on the internal side to really rethink um, what marketing means. And, and my goal in the next five years is for marketing to be banned as a term because I think it's, does it, it doesn't mean what it is anymore. Um, you know, marketing is a very, let's shout at you, let's put the billboards up, let's get our message out. Uh, this is a very much more holistic, community-driven approach that I think all organizations uh, need to take. So I, I'll just echo everything that everyone's been said because that's what people need to be looking out for. Winston? Uh, you know, what comes to mind is I, I come from the operations kind of supply chain side and we have this uh, thing called mass customization and it deals with the product itself. But I think it applies to uh, marketing and how you approach people. So you're trying to customize messages and appeals to a whole group of people and you're hoping to get them. So it's not necessarily a shotgun approach like let's just see what tries to work. You go about it intelligently and have data to back you up, but it is a mass customization. There's not, uh, you know, one brand doesn't mean one thing to everybody, and so you're just trying to find what that means for the different segments and and um, keep putting things out there. So you're just trying to bring in more people. Mm -hmm. Chris, uh, yeah. So I would, I would totally agree. I think um, you know it's it's about that that blend of personalization and customization. So let me tell you what I want, and I want you to know me as well. Um, but I think kind of a, a related but, but larger trend too is is just following technology right so everything is moving so much quicker now I mean think about how valuable your phone is right now um, even you know versus 10 years ago five years ago um, so everything is accelerating so much quicker um, and you know right now the channels that are working for you are not going to be working for you three years the same way um, so you need to be on the forefront of, of trying new things um, and you know many of those will be uh, failures, um, and they won't actually end up going someplace. But you have to be trying. Is the you know the, the nimble startups are going to be doing that, um, and you need you know big companies need to look uh, you know have that that nimble ability to to try things and be willing to fail, um, and just be transparent about that process of hey you know let your news know you're you're trying this thing out um, you know and, and be relevant within that channel, um, whether it's social or mobile or or however it is, but I think it's, you know, it's about trying things to, to make sure that you're not left behind. Uh, I think for us, uh, the biggest change I see coming is the definition of who our members are. <clears throat> um, you know, I work in alumni relations, it's alumni, but actually what's changing is that parents of students are becoming a whole new membership <laughs> organization that we used to just be uh, in high schools. You know, like you send your kid off to college and you're like, see ya. And that doesn't happen anymore, so uh, not at all, actually. So, because um, they call me, believe it or not. So, um, but uh, so I see that changing probably the most. And in fact, we've responded to that change by programming for parents, by providing resources for parents, having full websites for parents, things that we never had before, but now are normal. What goes on the website for parents? You name Sorry. it. Like, <laughs> It can be anything from like, well, here in New York, it's like, is my kid safe? And you know, what do I do if I don't hear from them in two hours? And <laughs> that, I mean, you know, will I get into medical school? Right. Like, it's yeah. a, it's unbelievable how much like uh, our students in particular are connected to their parents, and actually even alumni are still connected to their parents. Yeah. Oh, I've had alums' parents call me about stuff, and I'm like, what? Like, <laughs> call, call me yourself. Like, pick up the phone. You have a degree. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> so, but it happens. So what questions do you have? Hi, Stephen Weiss from the Jewish Channel. Um, a lot of what 
I produce as a journalist pisses people off. And like, and I don't know if that's the goal, but there's, you, you, you know, people lose their jobs and organizations end up not being organizations anymore after I expose something about them. And, and so a lot of like our base ends up being people who kind of like getting angry. And a lot of what, like there's this, there's this shiny happy model of membership, right, which is a lot of what you guys are trying to do. And I guess I would like to see what would happen if you would put on the, the thinking cap of the other way of like, how do you get people who are pissed off to be engaged? That seems like a very mean place to be or, or whatever. Angry naked tree huggers. We get that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I can take, I mean, I think the biggest thing is offering them outlets for their frustration, you know, giving them actions that they can do. So if they're pissed off at a company, like have them flood that Twitter handle with, you know, like really getting them involved beyond just sitting there and maybe commenting and, you know, kind of the dark corners of Reddit, wherever they are, actually pulling that out of the corners and using that anger as, as enthusiasm. I mean, that's, that's a very, you know, we look at, at advocacy, you know, we have, there are moments like when we work with the NAACP when people are angry, like they're frustrated with the Michael Brown shooting. And we need to give them an outlet and give them a place to go to channel that anger, um, whether it's petition the Department of Justice, whether it's sharing this, that I believe in this and I'm outraged, you know, giving, <laughs> Be an organization that can be there in that moment to serve them with a, something to do, I think is of huge value. Um, and I think an opportunity that digital provides for organizations to just continue to enhance their relationship with people, um, whether they're happy or angry. Like I think angry is, anger is a motivator. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, this is for Julia. I'm yes. Danielle. I'm a consultant in marketing. Um, <laughs> With the nonprofit organizations, membership or donors versus volunteers, are those usually done in two separate departments? And if so, do they, well, what's the best way to get them to share that? Because sometimes it can be the same thing. Yeah, I think what's really important there is definition setting. Um, I think we heard this before where, you know, I'm a subscriber, I'm a member, um, and I think resetting the term so that it's very clear to the user <laughs> what they are. You know, I think the assumption that just because I'm on your email list, you know, at the Sierra Club and I'm called a member is, is a bit assumptive in my mind because they haven't said explicitly that they want to be that. They just gave you their email address. Now, there's definitely an opportunity to work them up that ladder, and I think a donor is, is a, of such value because they've committed to that. Um, but a member should be, in my mind, a prize thing. And so departments, you know, within these organizations do have something that, you know, is really more connected to offline events or, you know, can kind of be extracted from the digital fundraising apparatus. Um, but, you know, member in my mind is more of a holy grail of something that's a very special engagement with the user. Um, and, and we're working people up there. But I don't think that people have really cracked the nut of, of what that means is, you know, one department running it. I think it's still pretty siloed. So the world can hear you. Building off of that, um, you know, you all talked about some version of measuring engagement and deepening engagement with people. Uh, and internally, you have metrics that say how activated someone is or, you know, how loyal of a customer they are. Uh, to what extent do you communicate those things to the member or customer and use that as a badge or something? Is it, how do you think about that? Do you say you're all treasured members and then internally you're like, well, but this, this person's a super member? Mm -hmm. Or do you say this is what you need to do to become a super member? Right, or put another way, are your metrics their metrics as well? Who wants to take that on? I guess I could start. Um, so we, yes and no, I guess is the answer. Um, you know, for Chef's Table, we are, we are very clear uh, with them why, why they became a Chef's Table member um, and, and how much we appreciate them. Um, and then through a lot of our communications, we'll, we'll do um, with, with that group as, as well as others, um, but often they overlap. Um, you know, letting people know that they're our best customers because of this, um, and here because you've you've done this, here's a discount or here's a sneak peek into this new product that's out, um, and so we you know we try to be as transparent as we can. It's you know you can't you know there's always that fine line of being big brother like okay so I'm if it raises questions like, okay, I got this because I did this, well, what if I had done that? You know, so you have to be a little bit careful with it, but um, wherever we can, we, we try to be pretty transparent. 
I think part of that too is giving giving the option. Remember the story I always tell is when I buy my daughter a Taylor Swift CD on Amazon, the next day I feel like a dirty old man. <laughs> Amazon tells me why it's recommending Justin Bieber. It gives me the opportunity to tell them that I'm not a teenage girl and I've only given them more data in the process and everybody's happy. I think that's okay. I think it could also be an incentive for people. You know, a lot of times you might see this kind of a trend in fundraising where, you know, it's like, well, you gave last year and you haven't given yet. You know, like I think you can use it as sort of prompts um, based on what you do know about them. Uh, or you contributed this much previously. How about giving us five more? Like I think those personal touches are really, have been proven to be very good incentives to getting people to take more action. Kind of out of guilt, to be honest. One more? Anybody? So I'll do one more. You do it. Um, so part, you know, part of the purpose of this panel was to showcase how membership is thought of differently and defined differently in other industries. And actually, when I spoke to everyone, I explained a bit of what you know was asked before that a lot of journalists feel as if they're they have a very different relationship, not just the public, but you know, journalists obviously will write stories that upset people, and that not everything as is as positive, or you could say almost happy-go-lucky. But what you know, really struck me when I spoke to all of them is they were sort of like, well, we all in some ways actually anger people or their disturbances and actually didn't make much of, I think, the sort of essentialist journalist position. So I actually want to end on a more positive <laughs> note. Um, and I warned them I would do this in advance. I asked each of them, what is a great idea that you've seen in the last year or a place that you're seeing great work done? Basically, what do you look to for inspiration? that those of you could look up you know, after, the, after the panel. So we can quickly. That's where we start. Right? Oh, yes. OK. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I honestly look, it's so cliche, but I look to startups all the time and interesting things that are happening to just kind of uh, figure out how, why people are engaging with something versus with us. And the thing that I have been the most impressed by, and it's very New York, but it's class pass, it's this like fitness thing. And so if any of you have seen, I'm just like wowed by it. I have seen more people who talk about class pass in my world, whether it's our alumni, whether it's our staff, whether it's whoever, and maybe it's just the world I'm in, but I, I'm just I'm super impressed by that, that concept of membership, like that those people that are participating mm -hmm. in that industry and that kind of world and experiencing all these things are just so passionate about it. So that's been the one I would like. Class pass. Uh, yeah, I would agree on, on the startup front. Um, they're willing to take risks, right? Um, and, and that's what makes them very interesting. And, and they're not always gonna gonna win. But um, you look about, you know, different. I mean, Uber is another great example where why like they don't you know, have a traditional membership program and think about loyalties. At least as far as I know, um, they just have an amazing product, right? And they make your life easier. Um, and so um, wherever you can simplify and, and improve uh, someone's experience. You know, it's not, you know, Uber isn't about Uber, it's about, you know, it's not, it's not, you know, getting a taxi quicker, it's about making your life easier, right? Um, and you never have to, you know, deal with, you know, sitting in the rain waiting for a cab. You may have to pay a couple bucks extra for it, but at least you know that and you're, you're, you're aware of it. Uh, I have two, uh, both very recent, probably within the last month or two. One is uh, DC Shoes is a manufacturer of shoes that a lot of skateboarders wear, but a lot of uh, extreme athletes. So X Games, you'll see a lot of it. They just came out with a video for uh, this dirt bike rider. His name is uh, Robbie Madison, two Ds. I highly encourage you to look it up. It's uh, basically his three-year dream of riding a motorcycle on a wave, like a surfboard. And uh, in this day and age where everything looks like it's uh, doctored up, and when you see the video in the comments, like, this is not, you know, like, Photoshopped on. It is truly amazing. It will give you like chills and be very inspiring. That's one. And then two is, because we're a business, uh, we're trying to reach out to a lot more customers. There's uh, a, um, a company called Shop Runner. I don't know if you guys have heard it. I actually never heard of it until um, my colleague writing in the Wall Street Journal and reached out to him. But they're uh, like 49% owned by Alibaba. So uh, it's basically like they're trying to be the Amazon. So it'll be very interesting. It could be kind of an East versus West thing. You know, like this Shop Runner is kind of backed by the East, and you have Amazon, who's the West, and, and see how this whole membership type thing is. is um, going to work for them and, and work participating because it gives us access to uh, basically 300 million Chinese customers right off the bat. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so 
I have lots of ideas in this front, but I'm going to stick with one that you guys are all familiar with for a couple points. Medium, I think I just keep on coming back to that as such an, an interesting place. I think the product itself stands alone for the user and the end, you know, if you're posting there, you have an incredible experience. It's so easy to use. You get your metrics. Like, it's just a phenomenal experience for both ends. I think it really highlights the individual and not the organization. So again, strapping away some of that uh, organizational mol molasses. Uh, you know, the White House is kind of cool on it because that's different for them. But really, it's about highlighting the brilliance of individuals who are, you know, really thoughtful and insightful about the work that they do. Um, and then, you know, lastly, I think it's a really nice discovery mechanism. I, I didn't, I talked to Amanda, I didn't know that I had room for another social network in my kind of daily routine, but it turns out I do because I'm really uh, receiving value from what I'm seeing there. So just some nice principles that I think um, they've done a really good job with. And I think The Guardian is awesome. I'm just going to say this. Uh, we spread your guys' stuff around all the time at the office. Like, I don't know if you saw The Counted, but this incredible tool and platform they created about police shootings in the US. And it's, it's updated every day. Um, there are different ways you can sort. And I think it's just providing such incredible value to readers who don't know where to go from this information. And you guys are really filling in some of the gaps. So shout out to The Guardian. That's great. I didn't put her up to that. No, that was totally. <laughs> so um, give me a hand um, in thanking all the panelists. Thank you.